There's a lot of concern in South Africa about the increasing number of deaths of women from postpartum hemorrhage, uh, and that's really what has prompted this lecture as part of a strategy to try and reduce these deaths. Most of them are thought to be avoidable. Now, you might wonder why I'm starting the lecture with a picture of the Taj Mahal. What on earth has that got to do with postpartum hemorrhage? In fact, it's got a lot to do with postpartum hemorrhage. Um, in 1630, the Emperor Shah Jahan's wife died in childbirth. It, it was her 14th child, and she died of a postpartum hemorrhage. And this building, one of the most beautiful buildings in the world, was, was made in, in honour of her. So one has something which is both beautiful and which is both tragic. And I think that is, in a way, what birth is about. It can be amazingly beautiful, but it can be tragic when women die of postpartum hemorrhage. And unfortunately, women are still dying of postpartum hemorrhage. And that was in 1630, the Taj Mahal. And in the 1800s, women were still dying of postpartum hemorrhage, which has been said to be one of the major causes of maternal death in which women are dying needlessly for want of common skills that every midwife and practitioner should possess. In other words, it's not rocket science. We, it's not as though we haven't got the cure for postpartum hemorrhage. We know how to prevent it and we know what could be done. And yet women are still dying from it. Uh, it's still common, most common cause of maternal death worldwide accounts for about 30% of maternal deaths globally. And these deaths, as I've said before, can often be avoided. It seriously tests the functioning of the health system and the skills of health workers. It's different from some other conditions, which if you discover them in the home or in the clinic, the woman can be transferred from this level to this level to the highest level where there is the specialist. That can't happen with hemorrhage. It occurs so quickly, um, the women can sometimes die within two hours. So the women don't survive being referred. And what it means is that every level of care has got to be able to do something about it. From the first point of contact, and particularly the, the hospital in the, a district level. Now coming to South Africa, just to give a bit of a context of the challenges that we face here, in um, the latest maternal mortality report, which covered all maternal deaths from 2008 to 2010, there were 688 deaths. That is a lot of deaths from postpartum hemorrhage. It was 14% of all the, the deaths. Uh, in the same period in the UK, there were eight deaths. And again, it shows the difference between poor and rich countries. Uh, th this is a rather complicated diagram, but it's trying to look at the different causes of maternal death over different time periods. The different colours refer to different time periods. And although it's not the biggest cause, this little group here, obstetric haemorrhage, um, has been going up. It's not shown signs of coming down, like this cause here. So, unfortunately, deaths from obstetric haemorrhage are not decreasing, despite having our confidential inquiry, which has been analysing deaths every year. Uh, again, another diagram, and it shows different time periods. And if you look at the number of maternal deaths, they've increased over each three-year period. So there were 442, uh, and then coming up to 688 in 2008. Uh, the last figure is 2011, obviously only for one year, so it's less than for the others. Um, on the right-hand column, you've got the, the ratio or rate of hemorrhage death. And again, that uh, has, isn't showing any sign of decline at the moment. Now, um, obstetric hemorrhage isn't one disease. It's a, multi it's a multitude of factors. There are many causes for it. And these are the causes in South Africa sort of rated in terms of um, their importance. It is, it's of great concern that the biggest cause at the top is women who bleed during a caesarean section or after a caesarean section. It's possible that the, this group overlaps with some of the other groups. Um, certainly women who have prolonged labour could have an atonic uterus and bleed at caesarean section but it's of concern how many women are bleeding around the time or after caesarean section. 
Then we have a rupture placenta. The next group is very alarming too, it's ruptured uterus. These again are women who often have had a prolonged neglected labour, or women who've had a previous caesarean section and been allowed to labour too long. And unfortunately, some of these women with ruptured uterus, it is because of the doctor or nurse giving too high a dose of uterotonic drugs, such as oxytocin or misoprostol. Then we have another group where it's PPH and the cause isn't specified. This is also a problem because it means people aren't even finding out why the woman is bleeding and she's bleeding without the cause ever having been established. Then retained placenta um, and atonic uterus and um, I'm not going to mention the other causes which are less common. So these are the problems we have to deal with in South Africa. The next question is where are these women dying? Well, there may be more dying at home than we know because we don't really investigate what's happening with home births. But of the ones we have reported to facilities, this is the breakdown. So the majority, as you can see from this diagram, are in public hospitals, 94.2%. And of that, 37.8% at district hospital, regional 36.2, and tertiary 20.2. And you would have thought if women have something serious enough uh, to make them die, they would actually all move up the referral channel to tertiary. But because of hemorrhage happening so quickly, they don't. And they cause a huge burden on district hospitals. And in fact, some women die as they're being transported from one level to the other, or they die immediately on arrival at the next level of care. This is just looking at some underlying factors for haemorrhage deaths. Um, you know, if, there, if there's anything as well as the obstetric condition that resulted in their death. Now, 48% of the women tested for HIV were actually positive. And it may be that HIV positive women are more inclined to have anemia, so they withstand haemorrhage much less. It's also worrying that a third of the women were anemic and maybe this is something that we're not attending to very well in antenatal care. 21.6% of the women had a prolonged labour, and this comes back to very simple things like normal care in labour. For the women who ruptured their uterus or bled after Caesar, over a quarter of them had had a prolonged labour, and um, age over 35 also a risk factor. Now these are just some stories of some of the women who died from postpartum hemorrhage. And although it's much more objective to have figures and tables of graphs, often it takes just a few stories for people to really sort of stand up and decide they've got to change the service or the way they do things. Uh, this is a 28-year-old, para 2. She went to a district hospital with an eclamptic fit, had a caesarean section, and then in the recovery ward was known to have low blood pressure and a raised pulse and was bleeding. She then went to a ward where it was still the same, still bleeding. And the nurse completed the observation chart uh, saying that the next observation should be at six o'clock um, and the woman died even before she could have that observation. So this was obviously inadequate monitoring and also the attendant nurse not recognising that this woman was in hypervolemic shock. This is an example of poor quality of care. Uh, a primiparous woman delivered a fresh stillborn at a level one hospital. Two hours afterwards, she was found collapsed in a pool of blood. She was given an oxytocin infusion, one unit of emergency blood. Uh, she died two hours later. Again, uh, too little was done uh, too late and after giving the oxytocin and the emergency blood she still hadn't improved but nothing more was done. Uh, this is another example where the treatment that was given was what caused the problem. A 40 year old para 4 with an intrauterine demise was induced at 39 weeks. She was given a dose of misoprostol that was four times too high, it wasn't monitored was started contracting, found dead at 2 a.m. in the morning, and with her, a post-mortem showed that she'd ruptured her uterus. Uh, and for her, as I mentioned, the, the dose of medication was four times too high. 
You would expect if women have something as serious as bleeding to death that more of them um, would end up having a hysterectomy. And obviously in this group of women that died, only 15% had had one. When one looked at all these deaths and looked at all these 688 stories of women who died from postpartum hemorrhage, and in fact that's my job in the confidential inquiry is to go through every single story and come up with a sense of why it happened. You, we found that 80% were either possibly or probably avoidable. So 80% of the 688 deaths, they needn't have died if, if fairly straightforward protocols had been followed. So let's look at something more practical now. Um, we can see what the problem is, we know where it's happening, so what can we do to prevent it or treat it better? And obviously prevention is where you start. And I think a lot can be done by prevention. We often neglect prevention um, and it, it's fairly simple. So um, how can we prevent postpartum hemorrhage? One thing you can try and do is make sure that women who are at risk of postpartum hemorrhage deliver in a hospital, a district, regional or tertiary, somewhere where there is blood available rather than at a clinic. Uh, and that, that will mean that the care they need will be available when they need it. It's not perfect though, because unfortunately not all postpartum hemorrhage can be predicted. We can do a bit more towards detecting and treating anemia. The other uh, thing would be establishing maternity waiting areas, which would be areas like a, a form of hostel close to the hospital where a woman can wait before the time of labour. And it means that when she does go into labour, she'll be next door to the facility instead of having to travel long distances to get to the care that she needs. Pre preventing prolonged labour, I think that was quite clear when I talked about the causes of hemorrhage from, from ruptured uterus and atonic uterus being related to prolonged labour. So if we can use the partogram, intervene quickly. And then just monitoring people well after delivery and after caesarean section wouldn't necessarily prevent the hemorrhage, but it would at least mean you picked it up early and that you did something before it became too late. Because if you leave it too late, then she gets clotting disorders. Now, one aspect of prevention which is really effective is what we call active management of the third stage of labour. Uh, if this is done, it reduces hemorrhage by 60%. It's a really important intervention. And the essential elements of this are, after the baby's born, giving an injection of oxytocin, 10 international units, then clamping the cord, um, controlling uh, the delivery of the placenta by controlled cord traction and massaging of the uterus. And if this can be done for everyone who gives birth, you can reduce postpartum hemorrhage. Also early latching of the baby at the breast and sometimes the mother massaging her own uterus can help. Now what about, um, particularly since I mentioned all these cases of bleeding at or around Caesar, how can we prevent hemorrhage at caesarean section? Well, obviously, we need people who understand the anatomy, make the, the incision in the uterus in the right place. And with them, you can also reduce bleeding by giving an oxytocin injection slowly over three minutes, 2.5 units, followed by an oxytocin infusion. And, and then cord traction to deliver the placenta is, is, is associated with much less blood loss than doing a manual removal making sure the surgeon checks that the angles are dry and all the tears are sutured and um, tying proper knots and uh, making sure that at the end of the procedure the uterus is completely contracted. So we talked a bit about prevention. Uh, that what I'm going to talk about now is diagnosis. Uh, when do you pick up that she's bled and how do you establish what the cause of the bleeding is? Now one of the problems is that hemorrhage isn't often recognised. You would think it would be obvious if someone's bleeding that everyone would know they've got a postpartum hemorrhage. But it's often underestimated because in, in pregnant women they don't really show much sign of blood loss uh, until they've lost a lot of blood. Um, this is partly because the mother seems to be able to compensate for blood loss. 
In fact, she can use, lose up to 35% of her whole blood volume before her blood pressure drops. And this misleads people because they think, well, she's bleeding, but her blood pressure is okay, so we needn't worry. But actually, by the time the blood pressure drops, one's in serious um, situation. This is just to show that um, how much woman, uh, blood a woman can lose before she actually has any signs. Uh, we, we, we say a postpartum hemorrhage is when she's lost half a litre, but she can do that and she won't have dropped her blood pressure or her heart rate won't have gone up. Even after one and a half litres, although she'll have an increase in pulse, she may not have dropped her blood pressure. By the time she drops her blood pressure, she might have lost two litres, and that is a lot of blood. Uh, and it's, it's important to, to acknowledge that because often health workers are falsely reassured and don't treat it as severe uh, until actually it's too late. So these are some of the signs of hemorrhage. The woman becomes pale, confused, increased heart rate. As I've said before, the blood pressure takes a long time um, before it drops. Fetal heart anomalies, reduced urine output, and you see the bleeding, but you don't always appreciate how serious it is um, until she's lost a lot of blood. Now, occasionally the bleeding's concealed, and this can be after cesarean section, when um, the blood is accumulating inside the abdomen, um, and often that is the one cause of bleeding which can be um, detected the latest, because people aren't visually seeing it coming out of the vagina. So when signs are there, they're significant, high index of suspicion and act quickly. And teamwork is absolutely essential. It's very difficult in a lecture to show how a team works. And you can have all the knowledge you want, but if the team of different individuals looking after the patient doesn't work, then you won't be able to deal with the problem. So what do we do once she starts to bleed? Um, and it's important that people act quickly and they know what to do. There's no time to go, go to the books and decide what to do. Everyone needs to know it. And essentially, once a woman is bleeding a lot after birth, it can't be managed by one individual. You have to get help. You have to resuscitate because while, even though you want to stop the bleeding, you've got to replace the blood and the fluid that she's losing. You've got to make a diagnosis of why she's bleeding. You've got to control it and treat it. And these things must all happen at the same time, which is why you need more than one person. The immediate management, and this is often done by the midwife, calling for help, and while the help is coming, at least putting up the two drips so you can start replacing fluid and, if necessary, blood. The next step can be giving an oxytocin infusion, which contracts the uterus, emptying the bladder, and sending the blood so that you can get cross-matched blood available. Very important to look for the cause. People often don't look for the cause. They think that, and their stepwise treatment stops at this stage. So to look for the cause, you have to ask some questions. And the first question, is the uterus empty? Uh, the placenta could be retained. If it's not empty, the management is empty the uterus. The next question, is the uterus contracted? And you can check that by feeling it. If it's not contracted, then we give all the medication we know to contract it. If it is contracted, then maybe there's been some trauma. Maybe she's bleeding from a tear in the vagina, a cervix, or even higher up in the uterus. We've got to look carefully for that, and if we find it, we've got to repair it. Now, this might sound odd. Is the uterus there? Well, occasionally, and very rarely during delivery, the uterus gets inverted and pulled out, uh, and then the management is to put it back. This is a very, very rare cause. Now let's look at the different causes of bleeding and what can be done for each one. And if the uterus is poorly contracted, then this is the kind of sequence of events. And you can see that in many cases dealing with postpartum hemorrhage, you start with one thing, and if that doesn't work, you go on to the next and the next and the next. It's a whole stepwise treatment. And health workers often don't do that. They kind of often stop at, say, the, the, the second intervention and hope for the best. Whereas always, if something doesn't work, you must go on to something else. So empty the bladder, 
um, giving the oxytocic agents, and I've got a table in the next slide which shows what you can give, massaging the uterus, compressing the aorta, and this usually works. If one's done all this, by now she should have stopped bleeding. But sometimes she doesn't, she carries on. And then you've got to think, well, maybe I diagnosed the cause wrong, I must look for another cause. Um, and then if you still think it's an atonic uterus, you have to try something different, like putting a balloon in the uterus to tamponade it. Uh, and if all this fails, now she needs a laparotomy uh, or possibly an examination in theater first to see if there are any retained products. This table um, is just one looking at different doses of agents that can be used to treat an atonic uterus. The, the one we use all the time is the oxytocin infusion, which is safe. Um, and when the mother is bleeding a lot, then 20 to 40 international units in a litre is, is sufficient. Ergometrin is a very powerful drug, but shouldn't be given to women with high blood pressure or heart disease. Um, and a smaller dose is required intravenously than you can give intramuscularly. Misoprostol can be a third-line agent, uh, not definitely proven to be as efficacious as the other medications, uh, but may have a place particularly when the others are contraindicated. And prostaglandin F2-alpha is a very powerful drug that can be also given uh, to contract the uterus. Now this is just a picture showing bimanual compression and this is something which can reduce the bleeding quite significantly when the uterus isn't contracted. And it's a useful thing for a student or a midwife to do when they're waiting for help to come. It, uh, it requires quite a lot of strength and I think only someone can only do it for about five minutes at a time and they have to hand over to somebody else. I talked about balloon tamponade and this is where um, the woman is bleeding from the uterus and if you can put a, a balloon inside the uterus and tamponade it against the wall, you can reduce bleeding. Uh, this is um, a kind of ready-made balloon that uh, comes from the manufacturer, but is quite expensive, but however some facilities in South Africa do have it. Um, many don't and many district hospitals don't and there you can have some homemade devices and this is um, how you can make your own balloon and inflate it to tamponade the uterus. And basically, you just get a, a straightforward surgical glove. Um, you cut off the middle finger, put a Foley's catheter into it, attach it to a drip, put it in the uterus, and it balloons up and tamponades the wall. And it's not expensive, and rubber gloves are usually available in labor wards. Um, in Bangladesh, they piloted this method where rather than using a rubber glove, they used a condom. And in fact, a condom attached to a Foley's catheter uh, with a drip going into it can be inflated to about 300 mils, and that can also tamponade the uterus. Um, so without expensive equipment, you can make devices that can do the same thing. Retained placenta. Um, this should ideally be removed in theatre, but if the patient is bleeding a lot, uh, it can be done in the labour ward with analgesia. And there is a problem sometimes in South Africa of district hospitals not doing this. The, the doctor or the nurse feels it's not within their scope of practice and they put her in the ambulance to go to the next level of care. And the one thing we must ensure is that there is the skill to do this at every level of care. So in terms of the genital tract trauma, we talked about looking at the perineum, exploring the vagina, the cervix. Sometimes the bleeding can be from a ruptured uterus, which can be explored with an EUA. And if that's the case, you have to have a laparotomy. Sometimes it's very difficult to find these tears and the equipment isn't very good and the lights aren't very good and you don't have long retractors. So actually having equipment available and making sure your overhead light has got a light bulb, you've got long retractors, all those things can, can help. It's amazing how much women can bleed from lacerations in the vagina. It's often underestimated. Another medication that can sometimes be given is tranexamic acid or better known as cyclocapron. 
and occasionally if there's multiple lacerations and stitches keep being put in and um, nothing seems to be resolving you might just have to resort to vaginal packing and you can use balloon tamponade for vaginal lacerations. Uterine rupture is a very serious condition and if it's suspected at all the quicker you get to theatre the better. Um, you might examine under anaesthetic in the uterus but usually you need to go straight to a laparotomy. Um, it requires a repairing but often a hysterectomy, uh, either of the whole uterus or a subtotal. Now, in some places, particularly in a district hospital, there may be a very junior doctor who doesn't know how to do a hysterectomy. And this is a particular dilemma. You have a young doctor, they're straight out of their training, they find themselves on their own in a district hospital, and they know the woman needs a hysterectomy, but they don't know how to do it. Um, so they've got two options. They can phone for advice to the, maybe the specialist at the next level of care to see if they can talk them through the operation almost by you know, cell phone or something, which is, is, is difficult and a lot of people don't have the confidence to do a big procedure. The other thing that can help is, um, is to tie a, a Foley's catheter around the lower part of the uterus, tie it really tight, close up the patient and sent her to the next level of care. And they've been doing this in some district hospitals and actually the patients have been surviving to the next, um, next port of call. It's not ideal, it would be better to be able to do what is needed at the site, but um, it is a, a last resort that can be done if the person doesn't feel they can do what it is necessary at that level. And it, it is a problem in South Africa. You, you often, the biggest problems occur at the level which hasn't got the most skilled person and we have to give people at least something that they can do. Now if you don't know the cause, then the quicker you take her to theatre the better. Once you get to doing a laparotomy, opening the patient up because of bleeding, there are again stepwise things that can be done. Compression of the aorta, then there are these special sutures that can be put in to compress the uterus, a bit like the bimanual compression. You can tie off the uterine artery and the last resort is a hysterectomy. And I've got some pictures of some of these. This is the, one of these compression sutures. It's like putting two braces on the uterus. You use stitches that dissolve, um, chromic catgut, and you compress the uterus so it becomes really, really small and that thereby sometimes reduces the bleeding. The stitches do dissolve and women can go on to have normal birth after this procedure. At caesarean section, um, the bleeding can be from a, for a number of reasons. It can again be an atonic uterus and then you give the uterotonic agents we described before. You can put in a, again a compression suture. Sometimes the bleeding at caesarean section is from where the placenta was attached and their extra figure of eight sutures and the balloon tamponade. If there are tears in the uterus, they must be re repaired and you can tie off the uterine artery if they're lateral tears. If they're vertical tears, you have to be careful that when you repair them, you don't take the ureter in your stitch. You can consider cyclocapron, very important after caesarean section the post-operative observations and any suspicion of bleeding after Caesar which isn't responding, the quicker you take her back to theatre, the better. This is a picture of the what's called the B. Lynch suture and it's really useful to have a picture of this in the theatre. Sometimes doctors get quite confused about how to put this stitch in and it's a really useful stitch where you can press again the uterus and stop the bleeding. But if there's a pic picture in the theatre they can sometimes go and have a look at it before they do it if they've forgotten exactly the order of putting in the stitches. This is another diagram showing how you can tie off the uterine artery, particularly if tears have gone um, laterally around the level of the caesarean section incision. Hysterectomy, some people think that um, it's never needed, but I think that's a mistake. There's always going to be times where it's, it's needed, sometimes because the uterus has ruptured so much that it can't be repaired, sometimes because the placenta is invaded through the uterine wall, and often people wait far too long to do a hysterectomy. They think it is so drastic that they try everything for far too long 
um, and the woman dies while trying to conserve the uterus, whereas you could have actually saved her life by removing it. Sometimes after a hysterectomy, there can still be bleeding because of now coagulopathy that's, that's um, happened after excessive blood loss. And there you might need to pack the uterus. This is the picture I, I talked before about this Foley's catheter, that if you've got a doctor at a district hospital and they don't know how to do a hysterectomy, they can tie this rubber catheter just round the uterus and it can at least stop the bleeding while she goes to the next level of care, or even while she's waiting for someone else to come. Uh, this is very rare, inverted uterus. I think they say one obstetrician sees it once in their lifetime. Um, but you have to act really quickly. The patient becomes very quickly shocked. And the quicker you can remove, um, reduce the inversion, and then remove the placenta, the better. This is just a picture of showing how you replace the inverted uterus. Now, just a few words about unstable patients. I did mention before this problem that the, uh, at the district hospital that a junior doctor might have, do they transfer or do they treat? If they transfer, she might die on the way, um, but they're worried they haven't got the skill. Um, do they try and treat her because doing that would be better than um, her dying in, in the ambulance? If you do transfer because the the doctor at this level of care have done all they can, they've got to make sure that the resuscitation carries on in the ambulance and the pa paramedics, whoever is accompanying the patient, must carry on giving the fluid, giving the blood. And there are things that can be done to reduce the bleeding while she's in the ambulance, such as the balloon tamponade, uh, this Foley's catheter, and we may in South Africa soon see this thing called the non-pneumatic anti-shock garment, which is a special garment um, which is made of cloth but with Velcro, which um, is tied round the limbs and the abdomen. It actually improves venous return and maintains the blood pressure. It was actually invented by the military, I think, for transporting wounded soldiers, so sort of by helicopter to the base hospital, but it can be used for pregnant women. Uh, now, I mentioned right at the beginning that it's teamwork that's involved in uh, reducing deaths from hemorrhage. Um, perhaps some of the things I've been saying have been more geared towards doctors, um, but the midwife is absolutely essential, and midwives are often the first person to come across a patient who's bleeding. Uh, they will be the one who detect it, they'll do all the initial first-line measures, they can compress the uterus, give oxytocin agents, they can suture, and also maybe they're the person who is engaging with a woman all the time about what's happening, and so she understands um, and providing emotional support for her partner. Um, it's not just the health workers on the floor who have a role in reducing deaths from postpartum hemorrhage, also the managers of the hospital. They must ensure that we've got the blood in the hospital, uh, that the fridge works where the blood is stored, that we have all these drugs that I've mentioned, that the ambulances are available, uh, they are functioning, patient safety, that there's enough staff, that we audit postpartum hemorrhage so we know in each institution what's happening, and to ensure the team works properly. It is so important to be prepared um, it's nothing worse than having an emergency and nothing working and no one knowing where everything is kept. Uh, part of being prepared is to have posters. I'm going to show you some algorithms later which actually can be displayed in all your work areas as posters. Some labour wards like to have what they call a PPH pack or box where they have in one corner of the labour ward everything they need when there's a case of postpartum haemorrhage. So it's got the speculums, the drugs, the drip, etc. So everyone isn't wandering around in all directions looking for things. We do in South Africa have a special training programme for dealing with obstetric emergencies and the more people that can be trained on this the better. And there is a, is a move at the moment to roll it out to midwives, CHCs, district hospitals, as well as doctors. Then practicing emergencies. Um, like one practices a fire drill in many institutions, you can actually practice an emergency in a kind of mock situation. 
and it's quite useful. Uh, I know we do in my hospital have a, a kind of drill once a month where we have a pretend emergency and we get people to act out what they would do. And when you do that, it tests how the team works. It also tests if people know where things are kept. Uh, it also tests if they work together, communicate properly, and it can often improve functioning. So when the real emergency happens, you know what to do. And in terms of cesarean section, it, it really does need hands-on skills and surgical training. This is just um, the um, e example of the ESMO program. Uh, it's the booklet that's given to all the participants, which has all the algorithms for how to manage every single emergency, not just hemorrhage. Now, mostly we're, we've been talking about hemorrhage as to what to do in the hospital or health facility, but we can't leave out, leave out the community. It would be quite good to actually let community members, traditional birth attendants, know about the problem of hemorrhage. There, there are many ways in which one can engage the community and improve the community's knowledge about postpartum hemorrhage. You know, one way would be to involve community-based workers and for women and women's groups sometime amongst themselves to discuss how when she goes into labour, how she's going to get to the hospital. Um, and in some areas, people have got um, collective transport arrangements. Now, some women do deliver at home. We're not quite aware in South Africa of how many women deliver at home and have hemorrhage. I know when I worked in Zimbabwe, it, it was quite a common problem, home, birth and hemorrhage at home. And so one maybe also needs to prepare women themselves, traditional birth attendants, as to what they can do at home if they deliver and bleed. Things like, um, well, firstly being prepared um, and knowing that if there is a problem, you know how you're going to get to hospital. Also, if there is bleeding, things like emptying the bladder, putting the baby to the breast, which causes the uterus to contract, uh, and whether community based workers should be given some skills to deal with hemorrhage if it occurs at home. There are some useful tools that um, do, I think, assist health workers in dealing with postpartum hemorrhage. There are quite a lot of international guidelines, but we do have our own guideline in South Africa. We have our own booklet, which is called this monograph of managing postpartum hemorrhage. It's got a lot of what I mentioned in this lecture. Um, there's almost a chapter on each cause. There's a particular important chapter on resuscitation and wh when you give fluids, when you give blood, which to a certain extent I haven't covered that much in this lecture. So we have our monograph. Um, now within this monograph um, are diagrams which some people called algorithms, other care pathways, and they really are an outline of what to do and the Department of Health has made them into posters and they should be displayed in all the important areas of an institution. Like for example, there is um, one, um, one algorithm which um, is shown here, which is what, what to do with postpartum hemorrhage after a normal vaginal delivery. And it goes through all the steps, for example, how you detect it, how you can prevent it, what you must immediately do, resuscitation, how you work out what the cause is, and then how you treat each cause. And if you have this in your labour ward, because people have got to have the knowledge there all the time, it can be quite a good guide. For example, they have someone who's delivered, they were treating them for an atonic uterus, but they carried on bleeding, then you then, you know, if, if prolonged ongoing bleeding, then you go to kind of this box. Um, and uh, I think these kind of algorithms needed to be interrogated, available, and they can form really the part of these emergency drills. Now, the same kind of thing can be done for caesarean section. Um, a doctor's doing a caesarean section, the patient is bleeding, um, this again, how to recognize it, how to prevent it, and then particularly how to work out what the cause is. Uh, if the uterus isn't contracted, you do that. If there are tears, you do that. 
If it's the placenta, you do that. And there's a similar, another one, which I won't go into in detail, but it's for bleeding after a cesarean section, which is actually is one of our biggest problems in South Africa. Women who've had the cesarean section, they then go to a postnatal ward, often very poorly monitored, and then they're found collapsed in, in a bed. Um, this is a guideline or an algorithm for recognizing it and what you do about it. So these are useful tools for health workers. Uh, this is another tool. Um, I mentioned that one or two examples I think I gave of people who died after, one after a cesarean section, one after a normal birth, when they actually hadn't been well monitored. Or in the one, the signs of shock hadn't been recognized. Now this is a monitoring chart that is planned to be available for all women after delivery. So that when the nurse records the observation, maybe she's quite a, a junior nurse or a nurse aide, um, it's a guide to recognizing the abnormal. So if she plots the pulse or the blood pressure and it goes in a red zone, she's got to call somebody. No one should ever be, have a plot in a red zone without someone else being called. So it, it's a guideline to try and picking up the really sick patient and that's a, another tool that could be useful. So uh, just to conclude, um, postpartum hemorrhage is still a major avoidable cause of maternal mortality in South Africa. There are well-defined, there are clear protocols available for resuscitation and care pathways for treating the different causes. It's a condition which, which can be treated. We're not waiting for someone to discover what is the cure for postpartum hemorrhage. We, we already know. The challenge remains to make sure the skills are available at all levels of care and that the correct things happen in practice. And these new district clinical specialist teams for, for whom really this um, lecture is meant and who will be giving this lecture in the districts. Uh, th th these people and these teams are actually key role players for trying to reduce deaths from postpartum hemorrhage.